All right, guys, so this is uh, The Brothers Wisps, number 27, take eight, I think. We actually recorded this, and it was brilliant. It was awesome, and then uh, it turns out Greg forgot to turn on the audio. Um, so we've two, done two uh, test recordings thus far, so no more mistakes. Uh, so let's rehash everything that we hashed out before, only it's going to be way better this time uh, because we practiced it once. So. Uh, up at the top left, you see Justin Wilson out of Indiana. Say hi, Justin. Hello, how are y'all doing? Excellent. And then we're up above in the, the top, tip top. Uh, it's his birthday. Tomorrow, yep. Yeah, rock and roll. This is the birthday edition. The birthday edition. <laughs> Word. All right, so as up long above. As you're in your birthday suit, we'll be good. <laughs> oh, that's why he has the video off. Uh, straight above <laughs> us is uh, is Tom Smith out of Ireland. So you say you're in Dublin. Are you actually in Dublin, or are you just right outside of it? Um, right outside of Dublin. Just like if you hit it with a nuclear weapon, I'd be pretty upset. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's not how I would phrase it, but whatever. Uh, over just here. Near just in the right in the top right corner, we have Mike Hammett out of Chicago. Mike, are you actually out of Chicago, or is that just the nearest thing that anybody will know? No, uh, about an hour out. All right, close enough Jesus, for my like that's like nowhere near Chicago. <laughs> but if somebody well, hit it with a nuke, Mike would be pretty upset. So, well, like, I mean, like, like to get to a so, metropolitan train is like a fifteen-minute drive. I mean, it's like I'm just outside. Okay. All right. And then over here to my left again, we've got Justin Miller, the beautiful, uh, warm Justin Miller. He's Little Spoon, as I like to call him. Out of Virginia. <laughs> Say hi, Justin. Hi. <laughs> little Spoon. The Little Spoon. Come on. <laughs> and then just above me is Alex Hart. I, my bald head is covering his name. Uh, otherwise, you would know that that's Alex. Alex out of the great state of Oregon, right? You're up in Portland, correct, sir? That is correct. All right. Beautiful man. And then uh, we've got Tarmis Karnak, the uh, fourth musketeer on board. Did you call him Tarmis? I did. Yeah, probably I came out. It's Thomas Karnak. I'm sorry. I kind of. Uh, well, cl close this. enough. Close enough. There you I, go. I don't mind. <laughs> Thomas I don't is think coming they have all the way out. Of... Down there. Do what? I don't think they have pirates down there. Oh, they Oh, <laughs> uh, that was awful. I hate you. Thomas is out of Slovakia, <laughs> and uh, he graciously woke up at 4 a.m. to uh, to be on this call. So thank you Good so morning, much, Thomas. Everybody. All morning. right. And I am Greg Soule, and I'm out of the great nation of Texas, um, College Station, to be exact, where nobody knows where that's at, but it doesn't matter. And Tom's up there fondling his nipples uh, to show you his shirt. That was terrific. Um I'm going to have that stuck in my, it's burned in my retinas. Um, let's see, so we're going to be talking about uh, the mum mostly. So the vast majority of these guys, save for these two schmucks on the right, uh, actually made it to the to the Dallas mum this year. So <clears throat> um, the last time we started, we talked quickly about the people we met that we thought were pretty cool. Because um, honestly, that's 50% of the reason I go is just to meet people and then to hang out with these complete weirdos, uh, believe it or not. That and a spoon, uh, spoon, uh, spoon Miller, obviously. Um, so I met uh, a guy named Quincy, who was a really cool cat, tower guy. Um, and he's kind of in the business of acquiring towers for the Wisp sort of thing. And uh, he had some really good tips, and I was asking him about uh, being on a future show, and he uh, expressed some interest, so that would be cool to talk to him. Because I've never talked to anybody that just, that's like, yeah, I just own towers everywhere. Uh, so that was kind of a new concept, and he said it's actually a really uh, interesting thing to sort of move towards. Uh, I got to meet a friend of Tom's, uh, Lorenzo. He's uh, very Italian, a lot of uh, really good hand gestures and uh, colorful sayings. Uh, it was brilliant. <laughs> He's a really super clever guy. I guess the closest thing to a microtech evangelist I've ever heard, so he really loves the gear. Um, he also did a really cool presentation, but we'll get to that later when we talk about presentations. Um, uh, and then Tom also pointed out last time the the new uh, training guy Caspers. I remembered his name now. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. so who else did you guys meet? Don't all speak at once. 
What do you got, Tom? Did you meet oh, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of familiar faces to me. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, guys I talk to on a regular basis on Facebook or some of the, uh, the WISP groups that you don't, you know, you don't really see very often. So, I mean, it wasn't, you know, not that they're, you know, not interesting and cool, but, you know, they're, you know, they're kind of the, the old hands in the industry that it's nice to see some of them actually, you know, come out and oh, yeah. come to a, come to an event. Tim Payne, uh, that guy, he's, uh, he's always at those things. He's a really nice guy. Uh, Ty, uh, we met Ty in the flesh yeah. this time. He was a pretty cool guy. Um, I met a guy named Raphael, uh, and I think you talked to him for a little while, Miller. He's out of uh, uh, Nigeria, Liber Nigeria, Liberia, in that area, and he does There's, like. Uh, there was two guys from Nigeria. They both do the other guy from Nigeria that we know, Avi. <laughs> it's weird. It it's getting a lot of traction there in that area. Yeah, you know? it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's it's become a real hotbed over there, and. Uh, that Raphael guy, he does like these hot zones. So when there's like an Ebola outbreak, his group like flies in and then does all the comms back and sets up videos and like to help uh, mm -hmm. doctors see the patients and diagnose. Which I thought was man, that's that's some that's some that's... amazing stuff. He was talking about how um, the people that he had flown uh, on the plane to get back over here to the states that one of them came down with Ebola, like the guy that was sitting next to him. So it's, he's doing some crazy stuff, man. That's awesome. Anybody else talk to me? Alex, did you meet anybody new? Um, I met a guy named John Brown, who I guess most of you are familiar with already. Yeah, that was yeah. my first time meeting him. Okay, um, so we're talking to him. I guess he's got quite a bit of uh, dark fiber uh, around the states. So yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Met I uh, light up some of them. Who else do you have, Tom? Met John Price. He was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Dave from California, the telecom, the VoIP guy. Uh, he was a pretty oh, cool yeah. guy. I got to see him again. Oh, and then uh, Alex's boss, Tom, uh, actually came, and he was a pretty cool cat. He's uh, He reminds me of a very San Francisco sort of guy. Uh, yeah. yeah. Did you ever watch the Tested podcast? No. All right, well, no. there's a guy on there named Norm. No, Will. And he's like he's like a clone of that guy. So okay. look him up. <laughs> Tell him I said so. Well, we also met David, Andrew's boss. Oh, yeah, he was there. Yeah, without a doubt. That's the second time I got to meet that guy, and he's super cool. I really dig him. Yeah. Yeah, he's a lot of fun. Good night. <laughs> That's my first time actually seeing uh, Andrew in person. So yeah. I was yeah. meeting him. That was Same my second here. time. So <laughs> first time I didn't. First time it was in. Uh, Vegas. Oh, I can't remember. Probably no. Vegas. Yeah, Vegas. That was the only other time Vegas. he's been here. Yeah. 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 Which was the first time I met him too. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and this. Uh, yeah, so it was the first time Tom met him too, right? Yeah, no, it was deadly. It was deadly to see him in the flesh. Yeah, it's really weird. I assume that if I know people, all of you guys know people too. So I just, <laughs> it's such a small world. It's weird. You you know the most people. Let's be honest. Uh, I don't think so. I'm too unfriendly. My Skype crashed. <laughs> You're still going. I see you. All right. So, we talked about the Casper folks. Casper was a pretty cool cat. You know, it's nice he to was. nice to meet him. He's been with the company about six months, I think. So yeah, he was still uh, really excited. Uh, a lot of energy. He uh, they're focusing him strictly on kind of the training, and uh, I think he's doing some of the mum sort of running the presentation stuff as well. So yeah, um, yeah, it's nice to see them really branching out and kind of you know getting uh, more uh, you know focused on what they're doing instead of running around wearing fifteen yeah. hats trying yeah. to get stuff done. He was super cool guy, real personable. I talked to him for probably twenty minutes. Uh, he was talking about how he taught technically at a university for like 10 years and then switched over to Microtech. So he's got a lot to bring to the table. It's going to be nice. think, really good. Yeah, no, he seems uh, seems like a nice guy and uh, seems enthusiastic as well. So let's see how he gets on. See if we can wear him down. <laughs> I think they I think they forewarned him of your uh, of your potential attacks, Tom. So I, I wouldn't call them attacks, but they, they could be seen as attacks. But uh, yeah, there's certainly um, unusual ways of bringing, making points that might be considered offensive from time to time. 
<laughs> I have no idea. Supply. No idea what you're talking about. All right, so we met a lot of folks. Um, let's talk about some of the presentations we saw. Um, I think almost everybody from the Brothers Wisp that went there actually gave a presentation, which I think is tremendous. Pretty soon it's going to be, uh, that's the only way you're going to get on the board is if you're part of the group. Um, <laughs> which makes me think maybe we just need to split off our own conference and just start doing our own thing. Um, so I saw several. I saw Lorenzo's. Uh, he had the um, the map light or the, the map and map light as the Swiss Army knife. That was a tremendous presentation. I think um, one of you guys was talking about how it surprised you uh, probably as much as it did me. Who was it? Uh, that was me. I was just saying... You know, I kind of going into it, I was saying Swiss Army Knife, yeah, I can see that, and just expected it to be a pretty run-of-the-mill um, presentation, but he actually did a lot of cool things that I thought, oh, that, that actually takes it to the next level for having a uh, map light or something in your bag. Oh, yeah, it was so, super cool. The idea of running... The idea, yeah, the idea of having VPNs that automatically connect, that give you a different SSID to tie into those, and... Uh, I thought it was clever how he had a uh, different tiers using QoS. So uh, he's got his free buddy Wi-Fi, his VIP Wi-Fi, and his uh, "You can pay me money." Here's my PayPal link Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I actually got a little jealous because it's such a simple yet clever solution. It's like whenever I go to IKEA and I, I I open a drawer and it does something so clever. I was just like, man, I wish I could have thought of that. Um, yeah. But yeah, like a little script that makes a light come on if he has internet connection. Then another light come on to verify that his VPN works. It's just, it's really, really clever. He's a really sharp yeah. cat. So definitely got to give him props for that. Um, what else did I see? Uh, mm -hmm. David, the telecom guy doing the, the VoIP stuff was really, uh, was really good. He did a little um, uh, Wireshark capture and Wireshark capture and then uh, decoded it and played back the audio and then he had some good tips and tricks for uh, you know if you're getting audio quality how do you kind of prove to your customers this way or that way so as service providers a lot of time it's not just making sure our environment's up but uh, proving that it's operating as per uh, policy so uh, he had some good tips for that which I thought was really good and then Tom obviously uh, gave a, a killer uh, DDoS presentation uh, and as promised he said he wasn't going to recycle any slides and he didn't he Created them all live on the fly. And, I don't think uh, I had a choice. Yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> well, no, I, I said I'd make a change, but uh, I was hoping to do it about two weeks beforehand, and I kind of enforced it. But um, I was actually quite busy, so with some contract work, so I was actually uh, I got fake all time. So yeah, I was doing it right up to the last minute. I think. <laughs> so. Absolutely, the last minute. I still remember, yeah, because uh, Disher was going before you, and you were finishing up as he was getting done, and then uh, uh, went on. So it was pretty brilliant, which just meant it was really fresh, and it um, smelled like it came right out of the oven, which was good. Thank you very much. Absolutely, uh, yeah. And so we recounted. Uh, I guess I don't know what are we going to call it the the Tom counter. So it's how many kind of. Uh, obscenities can he work in or uh, <laughs> odd things so uh, he called let's not people. forget go ahead I was going to say he called he said dickheads he said that once uh, bigger router bitches and then he dropped the f-bomb to a bunch of people out the door right in the middle of the presentation and kindly asked Microtech to edit that part out of the lime stream <laughs> uh, yeah I don't think they did though but anyway, <laughs> so they just need a bleep button just ready just a boop, mute button uh, Let's not forget the mic drop that he did at the end. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The very last minute, he picks up the wireless mic, walks away so that he can drop it and then walk back. It is ridiculous. Such a <laughs> such a drama queen. It's, that sh it's the showmanship. Well, now, having said that, I think it was your idea. You said, are you going to drop the mic or was it Miller's? I don't know which one of you said, are you going to like like drop the mic at the end? I, say, I said, yeah, it actually sounds like a good idea. I said, Obama thing. stole the idea then. The following day at the White House press conference. <laughs> yeah, so all this uh, political diplomacy you've been working on, I mean, it's uh, it's really paying off. It's good. Absolutely. We're going to start taking over things, you know. Sorry, guys. It's brilliant. And then uh, Wilson up there <clears throat> gave a lot of uh, tips and tricks um, for all kinds of stuff, which I thought was really great. Do you want to That's one of those things, you know, I want people to walk away with... Uh, 
you know, hey, I, you know, I can think about this on the plane home or, you know, something like that. Yeah. And, and I think some people, when they do their presentations, they think they have to give some like an entirely complete solution. And I think a lot of times you just have to plant a seed, you know, just kind of uh, introduce people to concepts and ideas, something they can research later. You know, Scott, I didn't know you could do that or this. So um, I, I think you did a good job with that, too. Of You, you kind of had a, a broad topic of um, doing security and whatnot, but you, you had uh, multiple sections throughout of different ways to uh, make your network available, highly available. Oh yeah, the high so, availability stuff. I, yeah, yeah, I, I like that because really there's. Uh, I had people ask me about kind of every different little section, you know. So it just uh, one yeah. thing would intrigue a guy, another thing would intrigue somebody. So, you know, uh, I was talking to um, Giannis, and he was saying that the European moms are so big because they have tons of first-time users that have hardly even used a microtick, right? So a lot of newbies. So. Stuff like this really applies to them. He said in the the U.S. moms, it's a lot of um, uh, fanboys, is what he called us. Uh, which yeah, fanboys. I don't know. <laughs> you say fanboy, it's got. I think of like uh, Apple fanboys or you know other manufacturers fanboys. Oh yeah. And so I know you know if you had to wait in line to get into the mom, you would. I don't know. I would just come late. I think <laughs> I would just wait for it. Um, Come on, we're, we're royalty now, right? We're celebrities. <laughs> Somebody has watched us, at least one person, so we're internet famous now. That's how that works. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was good. Let's see. What other... Um, what Let's other... not forget the uh, scripting skill by uh, Cox. Andrew Cox, right. Andrew with his bright Wi-Fi stuff, pimping that stuff hard. Um, he uh, did a really good scripting introduction and then actually put some scripts in there. Um uh, and I thought it was really great. Um, again, he had entire scripts in there, but he didn't try to explain every line, just form and function and gave you some ideas on how things work, um, which I think is great. Um, mm. The scripting part for me, uh, whenever I write a script, it's about every year, like actually maybe once a year, and so it's just long enough for me to forget how everything works and I have to go back and reference everything. So uh, having some kind of quick jumps in I think is terrific, even for people that are accustomed to it. I'm looking at Thomas and I'm sure he needs no uh, quick pick back ups because this kid's always coding. Uh, he does more coding than any other network engineer I've ever met. Uh, I will Just say me. the other cool thing about uh, Andrew's scripting, his uh, presentation was one of the last ones but several of the other presentations said oh yeah uh, I had Andrew script this for me. <laughs> so it's kind of this plug of leading up to, all right, I got to meet this guy, Andrew, and see what he can actually do. So, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, one of them, they, they used one of his scripts to generate like 32 uh, virtual access points. Mm -hmm. Lorenzo. With some pretty pretty clever names. Yeah. Andrew's always anyway. up for, uh, for helping out. And I guess he's become the de facto sort of scripting guy now. Uh, so I'm sure more of that's going to keep coming his way, whether he wants it or not. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. All right, any other presentations you guys saw that you liked? No. All right. Well, I guess we can talk about the Microtix product presentation. The new hardware or uh, announcements or. I liked, I liked the uh, fast path explanation. That was more in depth than I've ever seen him do. I mean, that was pretty good for me. That one, it, yeah. I, I watched the European one and it seemed very similar. I think maybe oh, there were well. some additions. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, if it's a Giannis presentation, there's usually going to be some meat to it, which is good. Um, let's see, new hardware wise. Uh, Alex, you got the list on the new hardware, right? Yeah, the. Uh... The WAP AC was one thing that was announced. It's pretty exciting. It's kind of the uh, unified competition, small, nice-looking AC router. It's only ninety bucks, which is just phenomenal for a, a dual-band, triple-chain uh, AC device. It also does um, uh, Microtix getting into a lot more of the 802.3 AF and AT active. Uh, PoE, which is, I think, pretty cool. Um, so that's supposed to be shipping soon. They've also got the Hex PoE, which is also going to have um, active PoE output on four of the ports. 
as well as input. Uh, so presumably you could use that to power not only the WAF AC, but Unify or any other uh, POV device. So that's kind of cool that they're, uh, like I said, getting into the POV standards. That's cool. Uh, what software. else do they have? <coughs> Go ahead. Some of the software features, like what you were talking about, I think you were on the forum hot and heavy with the the interface list feature, so you can zone all your uh, interfaces together, which I think is a really big feature, and the the dropping of um, the ability to drop packets before they go into the contract table as well, which is kind of nice for DDoS mitigation as well. So some kind of cool software features that uh, did require version seven. Yeah, I think it'll. So Tom's talking about in the firewall section, they added the ability to um, do security zones, right? Yeah. Uh, it's interface list. So similar to address lists where you have IPs and subnets, you can create lists of interfaces. And rather than having multiple rules, if you have similar rules for different interfaces, now you can just have one rule for a group of interfaces. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but for me, like that just cut my firewall rule list in half. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. I, I was actually surprised. That's a that's kind of a cool feature, and they didn't even mention it at the mom. You know, and well, I did. Like, well, they were announcing new hardware and new features, and they talked about some other things, but they, you know, that's kind of a cool feature to not even be mentioned. Yeah, and I was talking to Giannis about you know what's the. Uh, so jokingly, I saw he wasn't up there doing the the new presentation, you know, the the first one in the morning where they announce all this stuff. And I said, obviously they're yeah. not announcing version seven because you would be up there, <laughs> you know, nobody's gonna steal your thunder. Uh, and he was saying that you know we're not we're not waiting on the mums anymore to do announcements. He said, yeah, okay. I, he didn't. Well, I mean that's what he said. So hardware wise, anyway, he's like, uh, yeah, you know, just as it comes to us, we're spitting it out. So. I don't know. What were you going to say, Tom? Uh, that said, they, they also said that they were going to do uh, about one mum a week. So, like, so there's not really much of a wait. They had been doing one a week on average since the beginning of the year, I think is what they said. Just crazy. Um, the other thing they announced was um, they're starting to ship their new wireless package, the wireless rep package that's mm. supposed to give you uh, background scanning and um, some better wireless repeater support. Stuff that you see some of the other vendors already doing, but it's cool that they're they're making an effort to add features, functionality, stability, performance to their wireless package. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm I'm getting more and more excited about the, the MicroTik wireless there for the longest time. You know, it kind of it just seemed very unattractive, you know, NV2 would just kind of perform along, but nothing was, nothing was really, uh, you know, sexy about it. You, you know, you could put up a link and yeah, it did perform great, but you know, you really, you know, you couldn't, couldn't do a lot of neat things with it, but now they're, to me, at least they're, they're coming around and, you know, kind of refocusing on wireless for a little bit. And I think that just goes back to, they have more people to do. Yeah. No, like uh, the scan to file functionality now, I mean, which we've been asking for the longest time, so you can diagnose a remote client why it's dropping off. You can do kind of scans, and then it, it'll scan to a file, and you can actually look at the scan after the fact uh, once you reconnect. Um, I mean, we've been asking that for some time. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully they'll work on the point-to-point -point performance of the Microtech now as well. Like the point-to-point -point performance has been phenomenal, but the point-to-multi-point, um, we were just discussing like the need for some sort of sync or something like that for very dense sites, um, you know, so that all the APs are transmitting at the same time, so they don't hear each other. Um, when, or you know what I mean? So they're when they're all listening, so the site is quiet when you're when you're actually listening to the client, so that uh, you don't have. Um, a lot of interference because uh, currently, like you know, if you do scan on sites, the interference that you're causing for yourself is quite significant. So, uh, obviously, I think the likes of EPMP from Cambium solved that problem with SIG. Uh, so, it'd be nice to see some. And uh, there is talk that they are looking at some sort of SIG method, but uh, I'm not too sure where it is at the moment with it, you know. But like I said, how far away it is, it could be released next week, probably not. 
um, or it could be you know a year, year and a half down the line. You know, mm. yeah, it's a tricky thing to implement, but very important, I think. I guess it's a question of uh, you know, would you have rather them spit out a a G pawn uh, CPE piece or a GPS sync piece? Which do you think you would have preferred? Um, for me, because I'm not doing that much of the fiber, uh, <laughs> I'd be uh, I'd be on the. But I think a lot for like let's say a lot of their core client base, let's say micro in Europe particularly, uh, which would use a lot of microtic. Um, I think the other one would be a good bit more popular. Um, but then again, you'd have to ask the boys how many cheap pads they've sold. Uh, you know, uh, versus. Uh, I'm I'm not too sure. Like, uh, what's your thoughts on cheap pod versus just point to point? Uh, like, what what way would you feel about it? You know, so like just an Ethernet based uh, fiber. We really need to get a lot of um, cheap pod minds together and just have them bash it out. I've, you know, even trying to pick a single vendor, you know, that that seems best in class. Everybody has their own opinion. Everybody's uh, tried. It seems more than one vendor, and nobody can settle on one. And you know, uh, they'll talk about Calyx, you know, they're great support in the U.S., but uh, sometimes, um, uh, you know, it's just too expensive and they can't make it work, you know, or, or this vendor will have supply chain issues or uh, Huawei, they're really great and inexpensive, but support is non-existent, right? So nobody can, and then I've talked to guys who said they've tried three or four different manufacturers and now they're switching to Active Ethernet uh, just because they couldn't make it work. So... Uh, I don't even know I've, where to begin with that stuff. Um, I've seen a few providers too. They get locked into a certain hardware manufacturer's gear, and they get you know down the road where they want to integrate something like IPv6 into their network, and they can't because the hardware doesn't support it, and they have no idea when the vendor will add support for it. So it, it's it's difficult when a when you get kind of locked into a. Um, older feature set oh yeah and whenever you pick a vendor you're pretty much married to them you know it's like yeah. uh, uh, you know you you meet somebody and you marry them on the first date you know it's mm -hmm. kind of it's a sort of weird relationship we have you know whereas if you're going active e you can basically use anybody's gear and it's gonna work you know just pick the back-end system that's gonna do all the management administration that you really like and need and you can go from there I don't know it's uh in the in the world of uh, less expensive on the uh, GPON platforms, uh, Chuck Hogg has been doing quite a bit of work with that. Uh, he's a, a WISPA board member, uh, past president, um, and uh, he uh, he had deployed uh, gear from uh, Dasan Networks. They're a, a Korean company, I believe, and. Um, uh, he ended up, you know, it was a bit of liking it, and then ended up, uh, they just didn't really have a good channel in, in the U.S., and so he moved over to uh, Alfian. I think Alfian is Indian. Uh, yeah, Indian. And um, he's really loving their gear, really loving uh, the whole company. You know, they're uh, uh, much more affordable than some of the names you you typically hear about, uh, whether it's uh, Alkalu or... Uh, Calyx or something like that, but then uh, and then uh, Dasan turns around and buys Zone, you know, one of the probably most well-known names in fiber to the home, and uh, they were just bought by the company that couldn't figure out how to, you know, how to build a channel. Well, I guess they just bought a channel. Um, so maybe we'll have some either some cheap gear that uh, you can get, or we'll have expensive gear that you can't get i don't know which we'll end up with yeah. it's just i don't know uh it doesn't seem like there's i don't know i i haven't figured out a good uh system or methodology for finding information on vetting this stuff or i really really just need to make friends with experts I, chuck and and i've talked to him before um he's a really open guy and he's he's definitely into sharing mm -hmm. knowledge so we might be able to get him on um, and just chat him up about it. But I want a few different perspectives, you know, a couple of different people. I know JJ's been doing a little bit, um, so he might be a good one. And I've talked to a couple other folks, and it might be good to kind of crash them all in. Uh, we'll have to check that one out for later. Um, talking about on the Microtech, kind of circling back on the hardware front, they also did like a the LH5 
five grid thingamajig. What was that, Alex? Um, a light head grid antenna. There you go. Yeah. And I picked it up. L uh, LHD five. Yeah. And when they say light, they really mean light. It's it's like a honeycomb sort of yeah, interesting design, right? Pattern, and then it's just a little metal mesh on top, and uh, was it? Yeah, I don't know I that it a could... lot of people. I think a lot of people are disappointed because it had a uh, built-in radio, but it's only 802.11 AN. So, in the not world AC? of not AC. Why would they build a new N anything? Yeah. Oh, it's it's exactly. quite cheap, right? It's. Uh, it keeps because... the cost down, I guess, but. What's the price point on it? I'm not even sure what the street, street price was going. Like. Uh, what are they? I'm sure there's an AC at? one coming. They always seem to well, list price really is something dollars. Come out with something afterwards. Mm. The upgrade. Well, the the thing to keep in mind too is like what we were talking about earlier. You know, countries like uh, you know Africa and places like that. The U.S. isn't the you know Microtech's major market. Yeah. It's these emerging emerging company or countries where you know price is a big deal. So if you can you know it, it's the U.S. you know ten years ago, <clears throat> if you can get a you know if you can get ten megs across to you know the the village across the road, that's more than they have now. And yeah. so they're they're concerned about uh, about price. you know price. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And in yeah. radio is an in radio is the the equivalent of a G radio. You know when when you know, in first came out, it, it's not that big of a, a stretch for them. Yeah, fair point. Well, they've, yeah. Got their, they've got their SXT Lite 5 AC for 65 bucks. That's just $6 more and you've got AC. Granted, it's not going to be the same game. So, yeah, yeah I guess I you've got a point. Maybe they start out with the, with the lower, uh, the cheaper radio and add the AC yeah. model later. Or, or also, it's probably if you look at... Um, Overall, Microtech deployments. There's a lot more in infrastructure still out there, so uh, mm. still being able to support that and clients being able to just, I guess, reach further out to their existing uh, towers, maybe. Kind yeah. Of, maybe okay. It's out. also it's also probably a late deployment, as in it's been delayed the release of that. So, you know, it was designed for N in mind, and probably they wanted to release it two years ago. We couldn't get it quite working, you know. Well, now they have it working, so they'll release that, make money off the end model, and then they'll release the AC model probably in about six months' time. It's probably, you know what I mean? Like, so it's, they're, they probably well, want to take days to go. I guess they do have the, the Dyna dish, which is half a dB more, and it's an AC model. So that's it's probably where they're expensive, thinking. expensive, though. Yeah, it's 179 so you add 120 bucks to it. But they're probably thinking we, we have our, our top-end AC Long range point to point dish. It, uh, and now well, they've added the TPCP. To, to uh, put things in comparison, I mean, I know there's a, a feature set difference, but um, Ubiquiti's light beam uh, list price for the AC version is $59. List price for the N version is $49. Yeah. Uh, that's 23 dB. So it's, it's a dB and a half less, but. Uh, but I mean, it's it's already cheaper. All right. So just just since you mentioned the Dyna dishes, do you know anybody running them? I don't. I don't either. No, we've been kind of conservative on our point to point leaks. We're using a lot of Jira stuff mm. uh, for our point to point dishes. Um, we kind of build our own kit that way. Yeah, I was just curious if anybody's tried it. So that's that was. The new hardware stuff, I guess, to kind of put. A no, we forgot it. one. Did we? I don't have the list. Yeah, we forgot me. about we forgot about the new Omnitic. Ah, that's right. That's right. The new, the new. It's the um, it's the AC Omnitic. Oh yeah, right? that's right. Yeah, it's the it's the one where they. Uh, it's kind of a, a uni body mold where the instead of having have the two separate antennas, antennas like, anymore, it's all like bridged gears. together. Yeah, uh -huh. it looks more like a car. Gotcha. It's unisex. Like, I get it. Yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> Which bathroom does it use? It's asexual. There you go. Has no preference. Um, that's cool. And then, yeah, so last time, yeah, so this is jogging my memory. Last time I was asking uh, who actually 
because uh, I've never used an OmniTick uh, of any kind. And I was asking which of you guys, and several of you guys have used OmniTick successfully, right? I've been yeah, I've, quite I've, a few of them. And I'm, I'm really happy that the new one is coming along because the old one is, is, is fairly old at this point. So it was time for an upgrade. And uh, yeah, I'm happy they are bringing it back. Yeah, that's fair. Now, is that new OmniTick? Is that a AC? Yes, it's AC. Okay. Yeah, those are those are pretty neat too because they've got the extra Ethernet ports on them, so you can end up using it as a a way to tie in a point to point for your bandwidth and then you know spill it out. I can see that for a lot of Wi-Fi deployments coming in handy. Doesn't it? Um... Yeah, we put several up for uh, for you know. Little little apartment complexes that were, you know, maybe the clubhouse is in the center and, you know, 20 yards away as the, uh, you know, starts the, a square of the buildings around them. And, you know, it's, it's perfect for that sort of a setup. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I was going to ask the OmniTix, so the ports out, are they PoE ports? I think the number five is probably PoE out. All right. There, no, they, there is one. They, there so is they did one. have one originally, one of the old ones that had all the ports. Powered. Yeah, originally there they were two models, so you could get a U model, which was you know UP uh, power model, and then the without the po PoE power. But the new one, I think, is just one PoE out port. But I can't imagine the full PoE out is far away. Okay, so yeah. while we're talking about new hardware, and I. And that's all for the Microtech stuff, right, everybody? Yeah? All yeah, right. I think so. Um, the other thing I'll say on the the presentations, it looks like they've got all the YouTube and PDF links up. So if anybody wants to go back, you can go to mommicrotech.com and, and uh, click on the agenda for the U.S. and find all the links. They've really been on their game. Oh. They've been stepping it up, getting that stuff up quick. Yeah, um, and, and the change log, you know, 181 changes, they highlighted that, and a lot of people have, been expressing uh, they've noticed a change in Microtech internally and Microtech's been stepping up their game and fixing bugs that are really old or yeah. you know really working hard at, at you know getting their their product their OS uh, as stable as they can before jumping yeah, I think again. in the, the <laughs> last two major releases they've fixed I think three of the bugs that I have reported that were uh, many of them were like three or four years old and I had completely just given up uh, and they finally released the new bug fixes and features that I asked for so and I, I know a lot of you have said the same thing so it's, it's yeah. cool to see that they're actually fixing things and including it in the change log. Yeah I think uh, Alex, you, Thomas and Andrew Thrift have been uh, just kind of back and forth saying holy crap they just fixed that, they just fixed that <laughs> Uh, I've been waiting so long for that. Um, so yeah, they've, yeah, their transparency uh, with the changelog is getting so much better. Um, I think the community at large is is actively seeing them uh, making changes. We were talking about version seven um, at the last go around and and why it hasn't dropped or whatever. And uh, I think indications seem like they're trying to really shore up uh, version six, you know, and harden it and fix as much as they can uh, before they deploy any more. Uh, time and energy into it um, but uh, something I had heard was that even if they really dedicated a chunk of time they could probably do it in less than a month um, but that beta wouldn't be ready for you know prime time production for like a year after that so um, even if you did see it spit out it's not really going to be uh, ready for prime time anytime soon mm -hmm. um, did we uh, or something else what was it the 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 cloud hosted router, did they get some new drivers or something? Was that something that came out? Tom, I remember you were talking about something about it. Oh, yeah, no, like I think it's the. Um, no, I was just talking about it because I suppose it was a year since it was released or it was released in the intervening year. But yeah, no, it's great that they have the power virtualization drivers uh, finally for the likes of VMware. And uh, they've been working hard to kind of get them out. So obviously that. If there was a router I wanted, that's the one I wanted, you know. So it's, um, I'm quite happy with that. Uh, price points are still a bit low, I think, for the support model to try and improve a support model. You know, like um, 
like that 24 7 kind of you know being able to get bug fixes quickly and stuff like that um you know it's, it's very hard it's very hard kind of tap that enterprise market if you don't have the cavalry on the hill so i think it'd be interesting to see that kind of license level eight and nine where you're getting like really rapid response but you're paying for it like i mean yeah. um be interesting to see if they were going to experimentally do it but it's kind of hard to see how they'll do it with the kind of the licensing levels they have currently like with the one gig the 10 gig and then the you know the 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 price points of it are quite it's still quite yeah. quite low i think well i mean maybe support will be a separate payment model yeah i, I was going to say compare them to five years ago or four years ago uh they seem like i'm not going to say an entirely new company but very different now and moving in a different direction it seems like more uh customer focused i would say which is which is good mm. which is really good yeah. so now that we've beat the micro tick horse to death <clears throat> i wanted to jump in and talk about uh ubiquity horse today they announced uh that they're marketing to the consumer market officially i guess now is that is that what they've said with these new basically they've they've launched the whole separate website for this new platform and so it looks like a nest but it's not actually a nest it's like a wi-fi router and it's got a couple of little boosters you can plug in the wall that'll, I, well, from what I understand, automatically pick up the signal and then pump it back out. Does that seem right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> and so I'm guessing it's it's um, it's like a repeater package, right? So it's just picking up Wi-Fi. I know they show it plugging into the wall, and somebody was speculating that it was going to be uh, Ethernet over power, but I'm assuming it's just uh, a pickup and rebroadcast. Is that right? That's what it looks like. Um, and a lot of them, uh, not to beat the AC van uh, horse again, but um, unless you go with the Amplify HD, a lot of the repeaters are doing in. And supposedly, uh, I don't know, it, you're, you're going to lose throughput when you're repeating. And then to drop to a, a lower band, you're going to lose even more throughput. So. I think you're you're having to invest quite a bit of money in order to get the full AC throughput throughout the house. I think most of us need to remember that we don't live in Portland, where we get incredible <laughs> connections at our house. Like I'm rocking a 50 meg connection right now, so uh, that right. would be more than sufficient for me. Uh, as sad as that sounds, um, but I, I'm going to go ahead on a limb and speculate here. Um, <laughs> well, it's not really speculation. I think it's, it's pretty obvious to everybody. If they're going to launch this new uh, kind of core center consumer device, they're going to start launching peripherals that snap right into that. So I'm assuming there's going to be cameras. Uh, there's probably going to be some kind of home security uh, sort of-ish thing. I'm not sure how far they'll go down that rabbit hole. Um, what else do you guys see that magically integrates with this box coming out? There's a lot of home automation stuff. I don't know if they're going to get into it. I, they, they tried that with the M5 stuff, and that kind of tanked. Well, that oh, they, were, they already they already have quite, quite or had quite a big portfolio in that, so like just recycling or repackaging or, you know, uh, all and Really, that. that's all this is, right? They, they have their Unify platform, and it's more uh, targeted at the enterprise market. So now they're taking this, there's that same experience in hardware, changing a little bit, rebranding it, putting it in a square box, and calling it Amplify. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. I, I think I think you're right. They they have a lot of experience with doing the M5 stuff, and so if they take the team and the hardware that they've already developed and sell it in a little bit more user friendly package. All right. I feel like with the M5 stuff, they were marketing that to the wrong. To the wrong environment. I don't think the WISP environment was the one to really shoot that stuff towards. So, like specifically targeting the consumer market, I think is kind of a, a better avenue for that. Well, yeah. and then with this on this Amplify thing, I think they probably saw the Google router and said, "Yeah, we can do that," and then made their own version of it. There's also another company called Eero. E-E-R-O dot com. Uh, and they kind of 
launch something very similar where they're saying, hey, you come to us, you buy us. Rather than a single router and a single repeater, you come buy a solution and this will cover your whole house and you don't have to deal with like how to connect it all. So it, it seems pretty similar to that. Um, and compared to that, I guess they're coming in a couple hundred dollars cheaper, so that's cool. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I look at the $90 AC wall mount uh, access point that Microtech just brought to the table, and it's... The, the Amplify has Bluetooth as well. Does it? Yeah, Bluetooth Low Energy. So you program it from your cell phone. Okay. You pair it with your cell phone, you program it. It says... The smart way to support your Internet of Things now and in the future. Got it. Right on their site. Oh. Boom. The okay. Internet of Things. Uh, it, it might be kind of interesting because obviously we now have uh, Halo, which is a wireless alliance standard and Bluetooth low power and all the stuff a, like that. So. Did you, you, you know. guys look at the website at all? I didn't. I, I scroll down and it's like designed for your future amplifies a modular home IoT solution offers an incredible powerful network coming soon. That's cool. I was so. in jury duty all day, so I got bits and pieces. Um, <laughs> Did they say the same thing about you know MFI and all that stuff too? Oh, no, it's really... marketing, right? You have to say all kinds of magical things. Yeah. <laughs> and then deliver really quickly. It's uh, yeah, well, they have the, yes, the Internet of Things. In fairness. <laughs> the the trick is saying all the the magic words, but not having too much info so that you actually understand what's coming and what it can do. Absolutely. So in the last switching back, so I'm going to switch back to um, kind of a different topic that we we went into last time. Somehow we got onto switches, and I think we were talking about the. The C, the CRS switches, right? Isn't that their acronym? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and Thomas, I'm not saying he went on a diatribe, but he uh, had a lot of interesting points to talk about it. Because we were just talking about how we never, we never talk about switches on here. Um, and so we were kind of comparing the functions and features of the CRS line and the different models they have and how they function and then comparing them to kind of industry standard switches. And uh, I'm going to let Thomas ease us back into that because it was tremendous information. Obviously, every time Thomas talks, I learn something new. Uh, so I'd really love to rehash that stuff so I can uh, properly articulate it to other people so they think I came up with it. So, yeah, last time I had, like, what, a three- or four-minute monologue about about all of that. So uh, are we going to try to replicate that? Your, your or switch manifesto. Let's hear it. <laughs> so yeah. you, you're talking about, for first, which I thought was really interesting, is you're talking about the different model numbers of the CRS and what that actually means hardware and feature-wise. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Microtech actually has two... I guess you could say lines inside of the CRS family, right? You have the one series and the two series, and uh, the one series has a more powerful CPU. Well, relative, relatively more powerful. It's uh, 680 megahertz, but uh, the switch chip that is in there uh, has actually a few features cut out. And then you have the 200 series, which is more of a switch but less of a router. So the switch uh, ASIC. Is, is actually more feature rich, but the CPU is only 400 megahertz. And uh, so you, you have kind of a split in, inside of the CRS family there. And uh, uh, yeah, basically, like the, the features even in the 100 series for the switch chip are, are you know, enough for for most of the use cases at least uh but but it's still interesting that they would choose to to split it this way one example of that i'm looking at their wiki and i see that the the 100 series has uh 4064 byte jumbo frame support they're calling it jumbo frame support but really everybody expects 9000 or more yeah um, which, yeah, which they have in the 200 series but not in the 100 series 
So last time I was explaining how for me the the CRS uh, the whole series the one and the two series is kind of a low love hate thing, you know I I have a love hate relationship with my critic CRS switches because it's uh, things like this you know if if you are going to deploy a, a switch to an enterprise to a real you know network where you care about your layer two segment and you want like a high redundancy on layer two and and you you know we were also saying last time that. Or Greg was, I, I think, saying that switches are usually approached like a boring thing. You know, you buy it, you configure it, and you forget about it. Uh, for me, it's it's not that simple at all because, uh, like for us, we have a highly meshed uh, layer two core, and and like all of our layer two is is quite highly meshed, and uh, also that's one thing that you can't do on a Mikrotik. Uh, because currently there is no spanning tree support uh, inside of the hardware. And you also don't have uh, LHCP, so port trunks, or, uh, uh, you know, you don't have that support inside of the hardware either. Yeah. Something that really kind of stuck with me was the fact that you could do this uh, this trick with Mac uh, addressing to VLAN. So you can kind of, uh, it's almost like a, a wildcard string, so you can do like the... Uh, uh, manufacture portion of the Mac and have anything that shows up on that Mac automatically jump into a uh, its own mm -hmm. VLAN, right? So for like VoIP appliances or uh, you know just different things so like Grand Stream phones, you can have them automatically jump in. Um, so it can do crazy powerful things. I mean, there's a there's a lot of potential for a feature like that. Uh, but then there's kind of uh, you know features that are missing like STP or or uh, LACP, you know. So it's it's interesting. There's so much power and potential, and then, you know, and then something that also gets me is um, uh, they don't use kind of industry standard terms a lot of times, you know. So tagging and untagging, it, it's it's sort of a it's sort of a wacky way they do it. Um, and I and I, so, I totally get that once you figure it out um, and you can follow yeah. their methodology. I just wish um, that you could figure it out in 30 minutes instead of several hours. I I think what they did with the the, the, the whole configuration interface is. They have a chip that's super powerful, and rather than look at a workflow, what they've done is said, right, what can this switch do? Okay, there's a function for swapping MAC addresses, there's a function for swapping VLAN tags. So what we'll do is we'll expose all the functionality of the chipset um, and then work out how we can actually make this. Like, you know, so it's like almost like an experimental platform in ways. And then, like, I think in, in the future, they'll have it, like, okay, we have all those funky things so we can leave that crazy, like, you know, I won't say crazy, I mean, like, very esoteric settings and very complex stuff that could, some engineer somewhere will use someday um, that they won't find in any other switch chip, to be fair, or switch vendor. I feel and, like they need to have, like, a quick set thing for the switching for the workflow you know they got the quick set to make home ap and you know router and all that stuff the quick set for you know how many ports you want and which tags and that kind of thing that would be awesome well so you have tom's favorite advanced mode button yeah that uh yeah. Well, you know, like i think it's i think i i'd rather see rather than quick set kind of a bespoke mode like as a one for enterprise networking because uh, the guy, enterprise networking guys generally have a different approach to, let's say, ISP networking guys. You know, in terms of, you know, most most uh, most of the enterprise stuff, it'd be like switch port. You know, you're, so if you're talking about, let's say, iOS configuration, switch port mode access, switch port mode uh, trunk. You know, what VLANs are allowed. You know, that type of stuff. Um, port isolation, port protection. Like those, kind of unlock those features, but kind of have it like as an enterprise. Like, is the switch going to be used as an enterprise or as an ISP? And then kind of have an interface that has workflows that work for those mm -hmm. uh, particular models. Yeah, absolutely. Not so sure. gone on quick set type, quick set versus insanely complex. Well, and also to your point, talking about enterprise, um, I'm not always installing switches for me just to use, right? So if I'm configuring something for a customer, uh, you know, maybe they just want something to start with and they want to pick up and go from there. And if they're used to um, Cisco or Cisco and Juniper or Big Iron or any of that stuff, yeah, they they want something they can kind of easily jump into. And it's just, yeah, yeah. it makes it a little bit harder. 
The other thing that I get frustrated with is uh, <laughs> you, you take a, a CCR or um, a HAP or a HEX or, you know, different devices. Yeah, they all run router OS, but the way that they implement the switch features like VLANs, is, it, it, like there's no continuity across the hardware platforms that you expect <laughs> to be there. So th that's frustrating. And also, um, like you said, you just... you. You expect certain things to be there. I was really surprised last time we were talking to find out that it doesn't have STP and LACP. And uh, mm -hmm. today, learning that the jump, the jumbo frame support only goes to four thousand something bytes. Like you just well, no, that expect is if it says jumbo level. frames that it goes to nine thousand. And you don't, you don't really look for those cool. basic things. You just assume that they're going to be there in a switch these days that you buy. Um, and I'm also waiting to see when they're going to release standard like 24 and 48 port models. Um, you've got other vendors that they compete with like Ubiquity that's got their edge switch and they've got all those features and they're a competitive price point and they have 48 port switches. And they also have switches that have standard PoE output. Um, whereas mm -hmm. the only thing that Microtik has coming right now that I know of uh, is their X PoE that's got the standard uh, active PoE output. So it'll be interesting to see if they can uh, take what they have, add features that you expect to the hardware and software, and, and make it usable and compete with what's out there at a reasonable price point. Yeah. How long do you, do you guys um, have any estimation of how long the CRSs have been on the market now? I, I think it's been a year and a half at least. Yeah, it yeah. seems like it's coming up on a couple, a couple. of years, right? Yeah, it's a, I was thinking about two years. Yeah, but so, like, well, you know, all these all these situations said, the microtech of today, you look that, you know, hopeful that they will solve these problems. Five years ago, microtech would you just well, that's a dead product because they're never gonna <laughs> fix the problem. But now, oh, yeah, I mean, if if you look at the history, like microtech already has switches, right? The switch OS stuff. And it seems that SwitchOS has been abandoned at this point. I mean, they are still selling the 260s, but the last SwitchOS release was, I think, two years ago by this point. So uh, it's it will be interesting mm -hmm. to, to see if, if and what they decide to do with the CRS, because uh, there hasn't been any new hardware releases inside of the CRS line for, for at least a year. So there, yeah. there hasn't been any new hardware like Alexet coming out. And the uh, software side, there hasn't been anything for at least uh, a year as well that I remember, like any major features implemented on the CRS ASICs. So uh, we'll see, I guess. And yeah, last time also I talked about the Ubiquiti edge switches. Mm -hmm. And I am not really a Ubiquiti fan, but the edge switches are, are actually really good. I, I was really supply, surprised with them. I deployed quite a few of them. At this point, they work. They have a great feature set. They have uh, PoE, which is actually passive PoE, as well as uh, AT and AF PoE. And you can actually choose which, which PoE the port does, which is great. Because at this price point, there is very, very little switches which can do passive and active PoE at you know, at, at, at the whim, whim of a click. And the feature set is great. They, they don't have any configuration issues. The UI is easy. It has a full-featured uh, CLI and everything. And, and it's at the same price point as the CRS switches. Yeah. On the flip side of that, the Unify switches are the exact opposite of that with a very <laughs> slim set of things that you can do, um, but they're very easy to configure. Like, I set up two of them today, and... Um, you just go into the Unify software and set up the networks that you want and the VLANs you want, and then go in each port and click, 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 and you're done. And even select multiple ports at a time and say all of these belong to this this VLAN. And you know, it's it's very easy, very slick, but it doesn't have. I didn't see anything for LACP or LLDP right. or or any of those other things. It does have spanning tree, but you can't configure it it's in there because if you hook it up to a Microtech and you add more than one VLAN on on the device, you have to turn spanning tree off on the Microtech bridge, or you lose access to it, which is kind of uh, hmm. put me a 
10 minutes of Googling to find that out. Yeah, it's because you're supposed to use an edge router in those. I don't know yeah. If yeah. Yeah. No, you're supposed to use the Unify router. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You have the router. whole system. You yeah. The security <laughs> gateway. Like, the yeah. <laughs> Which makes me yeah. wonder, are they going to... Oh, like with the consumer? Well, no, because that's enterprise, not consumer. So the consumer yeah. stuff goes to your house. The enterprise, yeah, all right. So they'll they'll keep those two separate. And they've got they've got IGMP snooping and DHCP guard, which is DHCP snooping, and then they've got the broadcast, um, multicast, and unicast broadcast storm stuff in there. And On the Unify storm? that's yeah, and that's about it. So that, I mean that that's that's about all there is on that thing. But not a whole lot. I guess ninety five. Got more isolation too. But, does, but does the CRS even have IGMP snooping? It has DHCP um, <laughs> no, snooping I'm... built in. I don't no, know. No, no, IGMP, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, Greg was just talking about their Mac VLANs. Um, that's actually available on the likes of the TP links. So I was just logging in to check uh, a few. So the Mac and protocol based VLANs, you can actually do them on the TP links. I would oh, yeah, like. You can do that on most of, you yeah. know, good switches. Yeah. I like I, I, what I would what I'd love to see is that MakerTik actually for the command line do have like a grab market share. Like I think if if they want to grab market share with the CRS, they really have to have a command line that makes sense from you know that let's say likes what Tom was saying when he's building a moderately complex or a moderately I won't say complex but a standard level of complexity enterprise network that he can do it in about half an hour as opposed to five hours i think that's a big that's a big thing you know the workflow as i often harp on about uh, the workflow is so important to product adoption you know so would you say the crs is probably a good fit for an office environment where they only have one device you have one device yeah. everybody plugs into it and you're done right yeah yeah all, all it takes is is one time of somebody thinking that they're plugging one end of the cable to something else and they actually plug it back into the device or they have two, you know, wall ports that are go back to a oh, patch yeah. panel and they're both plugged into the switch and Users. somebody plugs in and instead of from the wall to the computer, they end up wall to wall and then you've got uh, yeah, loop, and, and, you're and there's no SCP. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. Down. Users hate dangling cables, so they will plug it right back in to, uh, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. So, and yeah, and when you have, when you have uh, wire rate performance with uh, in hardware, like your visibility into what's happening in the network is even less. Where SCP is even more important. Um, but no, like uh, I, I do think, like I suppose, I would say it has huge potential. And in fairness, I was talking to Yanis about it because um, I like to give Yanis loads of feedback, which I'm sure he's delighted. <laughs> <Yeah. with>. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, he kind of goes, "Oh, here's Tom. He's not going to give me any feedback." Uh, you know, he sort of melts his head for a few minutes. But, uh, um, but they were saying, like the guys at the music take table were saying that uh, with seven, they're trying to they're trying to merge the CRS features with what CPU can do, and that you'll have like like the way the fast path checkbox is. I'm not too sure how successful it's going to be. But well, their their ambition is that it'd be like a bridge and a VLAN, and it's like switching support, so it offloads it to hardware. Um, I I still think to grab market share, they need like what what Tom was saying, LSCP at a minimum, um, and span and tree. Uh, even like they don't have to have like infinite like per VLAN span and tree. Although I do really like the idea of that because. That's one thing that I see with a limitation with the likes of TP Link, where they've only eight instances of spanning tree. So, you know, for MSTP, so you can't actually run it per VLAN unless you have less than eight VLANs. Yeah, which, um, which makes me curious. Aren't, aren't uh, Microtik, they're just using off the shelf chips, right? There's, this is probably the same thing that TP Link and all those other guys are doing it. So I don't believe so, Greg. As no. far as I know, like, is, like so TP Link well, use Marvel or Broadcom. While the lads are using, as far as I know, Qualcomm or Atheros based chips back in the day. Um, I, yeah, at, so. uh, at the most, like most of your switches coming out now are all Broadcom chips, like the IgniteNet switches, the Ubiquity switches, Juniper switches. It's, it's all the same Broadcom chips. So if the Juniper QFX 5100 can do it, then the Unify should be able to do it too. 
It, 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 in the terms of the Broadcom, like there's the ones that I'm aware of is Broadcom and Marvel, let's say, are the big players, let's mm -hmm. say, for your OEM switches. Um, and I believe Broadcom may be slightly better uh, in terms of their support. Um, the I believe the Netonic switches that that legend that we interviewed in 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 the Whisper Palooza one. I think they're using a Vitas chipset, which I'm not too sure what, what its feature set and our stability is. Um, like that, like one one thing I would have said is that my experience with Marvel-based chips and Broadcom-based switch chips are actually is quite positive. You know, they're stable, they work, um, they're easily configurable, um, and obviously, I'd be hoping that the Microtech switches are. All three of those in the future as well. Like I said, I'm sure they're stable. It's just the workflow and configure them is, is tricky at the moment. Indeed. So um, I think we've beat the switch thing to death, and at some point we should probably dive a little bit more into it. Um, Actually, before we go, I have just one last thing. To again. all the switch manufacturers that implement STP, please, for the love of everything, let me choose an STP path cost standard. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's 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 a huge huge issue basically because uh, okay so for a bit of background there is three standards which dictate how STP picks a link cost right there is the oldest one which is I think dot D which is from ninety five and uh, of course we usually don't want twenty years old standards sticking up on us and then there you have two newer standards right and the problem is that pretty much all of the implementations of STP in, in <laughs> across all the vendors don't let you choose a path cost standard. And then if you have like a cross vendor network, you usually end up with things that one switch is implementing, you know, the oldest standard, one switch is implementing the intermediate, and one switch is implementing the newest. And then you just have a whole mess where your path costs are calculated, you know, just, just wildly. And it's the same thing with current Microtik STP implementation inside of the software uh, bridge. So currently you have to like configure. So when I configure Microtik software bridge and enable STP on it, I have to configure past code for every port manually because it defaults to the oldest standard. And it's the same thing for Ubiquiti Edge switches. There you, you know, you have to do all of this manually. So uh, yeah, that was just like a please to all of the vendors just let me have one <laughs> checkbox which will configure the path cost on all the ports automatically hp does it and that's why i love hp switches and yeah that's that's that i thought i thought 802.1d was replaced uh by rapid like in 2004 5 or Oh uh, no, it's not AD. It's actually path cost standards are separate standards. All right, 802.1D. Uh, okay. Unless, unless I am mistaken, which I could be, but but the point is that you know you could actually use an older path cost standard to the spanning tree standard you use. Very cool. Which is like in the Microtech, you can just choose rapid spanning tree, but still have old path cost uh, calculation, and that you know just creates issues. And then when you have to configure it for every single port on your 48-port switch, oh, God. <laughs> uh, it sounds like fun to me. I don't know why you're complaining. Because uh, <laughs> we all have tons of time on our hands. Um, oh, yes, yes, of course. I want to click manually 48 times. That's, like, my favorite thing to do. Yeah. So something <laughs> that popped back in my head uh, when you were talking about Giannis, and it's always good to see Giannis, man. Uh, he, uh, he seemed to be in better spirits now that uh, they had a training guy that was kind of lightening the load as far as that stuff went, uh, which was good. And he was talking about uh, something he specifically said I need to tell people about is the HTTP, uh, the hierarchical token bucket version 6 diagram that he put out. I'm not sure if they've actually added any uh, language to it because right now it's a super confusing, highly detailed picture. And I'm assuming he's going to add some stuff to it. Uh, so now I can check that off the list that, yes, I did say it, Jonas. Um, but I'm going to say we're coming up on the hour plus mark, hour like 15. So normally this is where people have fallen asleep. So let's uh, let's try and put a bow on it. So one thing we're going to try and do, uh, I think, is try and do more kind of targeted, uh, smaller ones when we have like a, an interesting topic with yeah subject matter expert. We can kind of get them on it and, and do that stuff. 
Um, I think we've promised that before, right? I have no idea. I never promised it. <laughs> I think Mike promised it, and he never followed through, and I blame him. Uh, Ooh, shots fired. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, blame. Blame the guy. <laughs> but as soon as Alex proposed it, I was like, that's a brilliant idea. Let's do that, Alex. <laughs> what does that say, Mike? Well, get... That's why I made the proposal. So. <laughs> but uh, let's see. So one thing I did want to talk about is Thomas, uh, kind of in the closing thing. I definitely want uh, Thomas to tell us about uh, Unimus. Did I say that right? Yes. Unimus. All right. Uh, and any new projects that he might be working on, usually he can't talk about any. So he gave us kind of a, a quick and dirty on Unimus, and I would love to do just kind of a little mini one where he tells us about Unimus at some point in the future when he's ready to uh, do all that. No pressure. I don't want to pressure you whenever you're ready. <laughs> oh, okay. So I just finished a five-minute monologue, and here I go again, right? <laughs> Bring it home. Oh, we love, we love man. <laughs> All right, so uh, I've been working on a project for for the last about half a year, which is now uh, finally public, and uh, it's called Unimus, uh, and uh, it's uh, at unimus.net, and I think we'll just put a link somewhere so people don't have to figure out how to type that. And uh, I'm really hyped about it. I'm really happy that it's finally going out, and uh, basically it's a... Uh, configuration backup utility with a lot of change management and change auditing and uh, uh, features and it's cross vendor it's meant to be as simple to possible to deploy and as simple as possible to use with a really low barrier of entry the uh, from from basically the beginning uh, the design main design consideration for it was just to you know have no hassle easy to set up easy to use and and deployable pretty much everywhere in minutes so uh i'm uh, i'm hoping to release uh, or start doing an open beta by the end of the month and there is a sign up on the website and uh i could i could talk for for a long time about it and uh uh, currently, it supports Microtik, uh, Ubiquiti, HP, and uh, Cisco support is, is coming soon. And uh, yeah, it, it basically just it's meant to you know get you proper backups and proper tools to see how your config changes between points in time as, as simple and fast as possible, which I think would you know is is a really one of the essential things that you need to have in your network proper versioning and proper you know, just just change auditing and change management issues, and and even to have backups, right? If something breaks, uh, and and you have a backup, it's a huge difference to ju difference to just upload that backup and have it back in working order, or spend you know, possibly hours troubleshooting and then putting it back into proper configuration like it was before. So, uh, it's meant for that, and uh, yeah, uh, so, that's like the fast short version. So automated uh, revision control. Um, uh, what else? Multi multi vendor support. Also, uh, you were talking about before, or I was talking about before, how much you like NetXMS, and you've got the ability to dump from any system right into this, and then have it uh, kind of backing up your infrastructure like automatically, right? Yeah. So if, if you are using NetXMS in your infrastructure, it's just like one checkbox, write IP address, username, and it will automatically synchronize with NetXMS all your devices. So if you are using NetXMS, you don't even have to touch uh, Unimus when you add a new device into your network. So you just add it into NetXMS, and Unimus will pull it from there and start backing it about completely automatically. And uh, if you don't, you can just you know put a comma separated CSV file in there, or just paste a bunch of IP addresses, and it will completely automatically discover what device is at which IP address, what credentials it should use, and, and start backing it up. So like I said before, the point is just to make it as easy uh, for for the user to, to have the, that end goal <coughs> without going through all the hassle of like massive configuration and, and etc. So basically how it works is you just give it credentials that you use across your network. It can be you know one credentials if you have an SSO system or, or 10 of them. And then just give it IP addresses, and it will do magic, and and just back up all your devices from there. Magic. And uh, uh, and yeah, like I said, I could talk for a really yeah. long time about it, but uh, the, uh, I I've 
I support tons of deployment options, so you can deploy it in whatever way you see fit. You can deploy it locally. You can uh, deploy it as a hosted cloud solution. So you know you can yeah, it's you have you have many options locally. You have like Windows installer, Debian packages, or you know just tons tons of stuff. And uh, I don't want to. We are already running for an hour and a half, so I don't want to just keep going. But I could really talk about it yeah. for a long time. I definitely want to do like a live demo where you kind of go through. Uh, so we'll 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 let you murder us then with it. Uh, but it's it's obvious that he is extremely excited about this. Um, and I haven't seen Thomas get his teeth into anything that he didn't just murder. So uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be an awesome product. I can't wait to to get my hands on it, and give it a go. Um, Alex, what uh, what's new and, and funky in your part? And so one thing um, that I am slightly angry at, at Alex about is uh, uh, his his boss. I'm blaming his boss because his boss started talking about all this amazing stuff that Alex is doing. Um, where he, I don't even know if you've ever told anybody where you work. I'm not going to tell him unless you want to tell him. Uh, but it's really crazy stuff they're doing on a global scale uh, using Microtik and all kinds of crazy security stuff that yeah yeah just this secret life of alex hart up there it's pretty amazing uh, i don't know if you want to give us any insight into that or just tell us about some interesting things that you are doing or looking forward to what you got yeah so the the big thing there is just uh when you're dealing with large infrastructure being able to manage it being able to dive in and diagnose issues and proactively uh set things up so that things are uh, easier to manage, and hopefully you don't run into as many problems that way. Um, there's a lot of interesting things that we're doing, both uh, customer-facing um, and also internally to support our employee networks. Um, the latest thing that I've been working on is Proxmox, and looking at that as an alternative to uh, VMware on the employee network side of things. Um, so we're experimenting with Proxmox and Ceph. And that's pretty exciting. Is the driver for that um, optimization or saving money or both? Or uh, We've already got a pretty good setup with uh, VMware and ESX, uh, vSphere. Uh, but we're really trying to uh, find something that maybe solves a few extra things, uh, does what we're already doing, and can save money. Um, so it's definitely, uh, from what I've seen so far, not as polished and dummy proof as VMware, but um, it's one of those things where I see a lot of potential and there's a lot of cost savings to be had. So we'll see where it goes. It might just be an experiment or it might be something that changes how we do things. That's cool, man. All right, Miller. Yeah, I know you're usually super secret squirrel. So uh, anything interesting other than uh, you got a new house. Uh, so he's, he's pimping the, the two houses, Slumlord action. Like a player. Yeah. Bam. We had the home inspection today and it went okay. It's a <laughs> twelve year old house with twelve year old house problems. So you know, HVAC is close. The hot, hot water heater actually has a problem. <laughs> it's stuff like that. But uh it's probably gonna be going on through the sale and hopefully next time we do the podcast, uh it'll be from my new office. There you go. That'd the frog cool. room. The frog so, room. Very cool. Yeah. So anything new and interesting you want to talk about, or is, or is everything hush-hush? Because I know you're usually pretty quiet about everything. It's got a lot of, a whole lot of new business. We're super busy. Right. And, uh, a lot going on. So. so life's busy for you. I get it, man. I get it. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> some people yeah. say that. Uh, I think if you own the company, that's a great thing. If you're a, a lowly slave uh, like us, it gets pretty rough. Uh, yeah. Hammy, what, uh, what's new and exciting, other than your uh, illustrious world travel uh, on everybody else's dime, what else is new? What kind of shows are you everybody going to? It's like, it's like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop and find some more dimes so I can do some of these trips. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, one of our uh, mini-series, where, where Mike's at today. Well, like in the next next two months, I've got three conferences. Exactly. <laughs> Four. I'm speaking in one of them, and at two more, three more. 
Secretly, Mike's actually a booth babe. So yeah, there it is, bikini. A secret look at this. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, not, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, if I wasn't such a booth babe, how did I uh, manage to arrange that? Yeah, that's right. That's Mike's new news. Uh, he uh, he locked it down. He liked it so much he put a ring on it. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, she did. Yeah, I saw, the, uh, I saw the. I saw the. Join that family, huh? I saw the photos yeah, today. Yeah. It looked like it was a pretty good time, man. It was. Mm-hmm. And she still seems so normal, which perplexes me. I don't see how that happened. Yeah. I, it, uh, <laughs> I can't explain it. Was that chloroform? <laughs> how does she put up with you? Uh, I, I don't ask questions I don't want the answer to. Heavy sedation. Yeah, well, yeah. You, you've got a lifetime to figure that out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Smith, you've been awfully so quiet funny. tonight. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you're okay. I'm okay. Well, it's what, 2 a.m.? Been, been yeah. early in the morning, uh, kind of 4 in the morning. Well, what's new and exciting? Well, uh, what's new and exciting you could tell us about? Well, no, my comment was uh, talking about BGB flow spec, and it was annoying me that uh, he knew something that I didn't. So I said I better look this up and start working on it. The, so, not that I knew something that I knew something about BGP security. That you didn't <laughs> so I was looking at it, and uh, yeah, I'm delighted to report that a lot of providers don't like implementing it. So I was like, okay. So we're kind of haggling, and one of my providers has come back. They won't; they remain nameless for now. But they said, if you run DDoS traffic through our network, we're going to hit you with a hundred percent, not ninety-five percentile. And I was like, nice. That's really awesomely friendly of you. How sweet. So for the burst. So they said we don't want that traffic anywhere near our network. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, and uh, they should make their network better so you know none well, of it ever touches I think I'm going to reply to them and say I'm not instigating the DDoS <laughs> I'm not like uh, deliver. you know it's, it's not I'm not using them as a delivery platform for my DDoSs um, but yeah so kind of working on a few if projects they don't want the DDoS, if they don't want the DDoS then they should support flow, uh, BGP flow spec so you can tell them hey there's a DDoS shut it down exactly that's so, um, yeah, so I'm kind of talking to, but it looks like I'll have to go a more traditional route, like loads of internet exchange links um, to kind of reduce risk. But it's a pain in the ass because it's a lot more expensive, you know, the layer two transit is quite, is a significantly higher cost than a standard IP transit. So, um, but yeah, just looking at a few different options on that type of stuff. So kind of interesting, actually. But uh, I do think flow spec is too far reaching. Um, that they kind of tried to do too much with it. Um, but we'll talk about that again. Like, but like, there's stuff that you definitely would never want to accept from your customer in terms of flow spec. Like where you're saying block things based on source, but, but you know, so it's almost unimplementable because it's like, oh, block Greg Soul's IP because he, you know, he's DDoSing me. You know, they would never work on the whole trust model. It's like, yeah, just oh, sure. No, that's a source based. It's source destination. Yeah, it's source and yeah. destination. Is attacking but you. if they do destination based stuff, I think that's workable. Well, I, I thought uh, it was. I thought it was them in tandem. So, so like in traditional black trigger black hole, it uh, just says everybody going to this destination, uh, just stop it. So that destination basically becomes defunct, and and the DDoS wins, right? Whereas flow spec actually says. This source going to this destination block it, so legitimate traffic or some anyway should well, what, still be able to get through, right? What you could also do, like based on packet parameters, so you could do it, let's say, based on destination. So I'm being attacked by DNS amplification. I could say block everything with source port 53, go to this address. Mm -hmm. So I think that so it should be like if if you can classify it based on destination and our a protocol and a protocol. That should be allowed. That that's that's implementable from a trust model point of view yeah. because I don't want to be able to block my IPs on certain with certain protocols and ports go to those IPs, which would do what I need to get done. But uh, 
Yeah, no. But in fairness, I can understand there are limits to like like Cisco. We're talking about how many T cam cells they use for this type of stuff. So I I could see kind of it being used as potential attack vendor or vector for their platform. So what annoys me too is that Cisco only supports it on the ASR series routers and the uh, CRS routers, the carrier yeah. router switches or whatever. So. Uh, most organizations aren't going to be able to support that, as well as Microtik doesn't support FlowSpec yet either. So, um, trigger black hole yeah. is still kind of your your only thing. No, I like uh, I'm looking at seeing if there's a like, way of going for it, like with just communities, but uh, kind of similar to your QoS method that you were doing before, which I think is uh, is a good idea. Um, so I'll be dusting down that presentation, robbing all your ideas, nice. and uh, presenting them as my own. Fantastic. Hey, man, sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> <laughs> no, so th that's the kind of stuff I'm working on at the moment. Uh, cool. So we have a few projects in the pipeline for DDoS protection. And we have a few uncooperative transit providers who are saying, no, no effing way. <laughs> Get the F off my network. No way. So I'm trying to tell them to man the F up and just uh, give me what I effing want. Fair enough. That sounds not Hello, unreasonable. Hello, AS174, by the way. <laughs> All right, Mr. Wilson, <laughs> uh, what do you what do you have new and exciting or going? I remember you told us some cool stuff last time. Uh, I don't want to rehash it for you. I'll let you tell us about it. Well, Mike and I will be at Chinog this week, the uh, Chicago Network Operators Group. I'll be at uh, uh, Nanog, which is coming to Chicago. So if anybody's... Uh, in the Chicago, within Chicago driving distance or whatever, I highly encourage you to get to get to Nanog. That's where the that's where the big boys play. Um, you know, you'll you'll have the uh, the Hurricane Electrics and the Netflixes and all those folks running around. Um, heck, even since our our last attempt at this, I have uh, three three IPv6 only networks to bring online. So that's that's kind of cool. Very cool. Um, and uh, I did uh, I did sign a publishing deal, so there will be some uh, written works coming out here uh, probably uh, probably near the end of the year. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. And I know you weren't planning on uh, telling anybody, but you're releasing those breakdance manuals, right? How to pop and lock? <laughs> yep, yep. Pop, yeah. lock, and drop it. There you go, brother. Keeping it hot. That's awesome, man. That's so cool, dude. You guys are doing some awesome stuff up there. Uh, I have been trying to get to Chicago. I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but I want to come up there and see you guys and all that magic you guys are doing up there. Um, I guess last and certainly least is uh, is me. Um, so one thing I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing another Linda course pretty soon, and it's going to be on uh, troubleshooting, right, which I think is a really good one. So it's kind of a hole in there. Um, a hole in their learning paths, right? It's just there's no kind of hands-on troubleshooting methodology. So uh, I've been tasked to come up with some uh, things to troubleshoot, which is I'm soliciting uh, anything anybody would like to see troubleshot, right? So it's going to be like layer one, layer two, wireless, uh, rogue DHCP on the network. How do you find those guys? Uh, you know, just things like that. And then quick uh, mitigation techniques, command line tools to find that stuff. So if you guys have any suggestions, be sure to shoot them my way. And obviously any of the guys in the pictures up here, um, anticipating several responses from all of you. Uh, Tom has sent me a, a novel on some of the things he thinks we should uh, do over at Linda. And so he's always, he's got the, it's the man with the ideas. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was I'm doing the Strayanet project now. Uh, I'm sure you guys can uh, look it up and find me. So it's MDUISP services. Um, you know, uh, if you're an ISP and you want to bring internet to an MDU, I'm happy to pick it up and deliver service all the way down the end user, put a router in their room and do all the software back in, profit sharing with the MDU, all that good stuff. You guys can bring me some work. I want to, I want to compensate you for it too. Uh, so that's going to be my next adventure as well. Um, and then I have a potentially big partner coming up with some new stuff. Who knows what will happen? Uh, less sleep for me, obviously. Um, and then when I'm doing these Linda courses, I kind of shut off, but I promise not to do that anymore. Uh, I'm going to try and stay on top of this stuff. Um, I guess that's all that's 
new and interesting from me, if you can call that interesting. Um, wow. But definitely trying to step up our game on this stuff uh, and make sure that we record audio more frequently. That'll be a lot more fun. Um, and then just pictures of us. I tempted, or I was tempted to just release the video uh, with no words as an April Fool's joke, but I didn't do it. Um, so any closing words from anybody? I know Alex closed it up nicely last time. You wanna you wanna put a cherry on top, Alex? You're telling nah, everybody. You, to, you, you're telling everybody to submit ideas and questions. Come on. Right. Yeah. So. We're we're here not just to talk to each other and ourselves and hear ourselves talk, but uh, really to cover topics that everybody's interested in hearing. So uh, last time I just summed it up by saying, you as a viewer, if there's something you want to hear us talk about, if there's ideas uh, that you have, if there's questions you have, if you see you know new things out there that we're not already talking about, uh, feel free to drop us a tip on our Facebook page or whatever and. Uh, probably Mike will pick that up pretty quick. And, oh yeah. Uh, we'll put it together and talk about it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and I guess from all over the world, thank you guys. Uh, keep coming back. We look forward to it. And uh, thanks and bye. Good night, everybody. <laughs>